Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Zach. And I'm Seth. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right, we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are. We are. We are. We we are uh, back in our um, Cambridge studios. We already said that in the last episode that we recorded. Oh, we did? Yes, that we're back. Oh. But we are we are properly back because when we recorded that we hadn't actually left secretly. Shh, no, don't go talking about how the pasta's made. Well, we'll just do a bit about Doug now. All right. Oh, Doug's a funny man. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, producer Doug doesn't like that. He's glaring at me. I do need to apologize, listeners, as I'm recovering from what I believe is a cold, so my voice might sound weird in this episode. Zach, I have to tell you something. What they don't care. Uh, your voice always sounds weird. That's nice of you, Seth. Anyway, what have you been recently playing? So recently, I've been playing a game called Cats and the Other Lives, uh, developed and published by Cultic Games and released November of 2022. It's a part interactive fiction, part kitty adventure game. You play as a cat named Aspen, who is a large orange tabby cat. And you live in this mansion because that's where your owner lives. And your owner is a cranky old man who apparently breeds cats named Aspen. And all of his cats are named Aspen because he loves Aspen Mountains. I don't know. I didn't get that. I played about two and a half hours of the game. So I don't know if that's the, if there's a secret why the cat's named Aspen. But you play as a cat and your owner dies. And that's not a spoiler because that's the premise of the game. <laughs> so your owner is dead and there you there's a funeral and the family comes as a reunion and they have to kind of work together as a family and solve, you know, what what are they doing with the house and um are they going to be able to keep it because the house is very large but it's also falling apart and as a cat you uh, wander around and scratch scratching posts, eat cat food, jump on tables and swat things uh, and rub up against people. What I really like about the game is all the dialogue is written and you can read it, but everyone sounds like Charlie Brown adults. You can't actually understand any of the dialogue because you're a cat, but because you're a human playing the game, you can read the dialogue. <laughs> so it's a fun game. Uh, I thought it was a pretty unique way of telling a story. I've been really enjoying it and I'm uh, looking forward to finishing it up. I did play a good portion. It was a really good plane game and I played a good portion of it on the plane. Uh, I think uh, two and a half hours. I think I watched Spider-Man, the sequel to Into the Spider-Verse, the beginning of the plane ride. And then I played the cat game for another two and a half hours. And that was pretty much the plane ride. So yeah, it was a, it was a fun game. I think it's, I'm looking forward to finishing it uh it plays pretty well on the steam deck and yeah it's uh cats and the other lives check it out if you want a kind of casual adventure game where you play the cat and do cat things like scratch scratching posts and meow at people that sounds fun what have you been recently playing seth recently i've been playing sonic superstars which released on october 17th 2023 sonic superstars is a new sonic game as the name implies developed by air zest and sonic team and published by sega the game is in many ways a return to form for classic sonic complete with side scrolling gameplay and a 2d perspective the game does use 3d graphics so it's not using like 16-bit art style it's using 3d models so the game actually is more of like a 2.5d game as opposed to a 2d game but does feature gameplay and physics similar to the classic sonic games that we all remember from the sega genesis unlike sonic mania it does feature brand new levels so it doesn't feature any returning levels um has 12 new zones uh each split into different acts and it also features five playable characters sonic knuckles tails amy and a new character named Trip, who you can only play once you beat the game. So spoiler alert, you can play as Trip. Uh, it does feature some quirks that took me a bit to get used to. For one thing, there are no lives. Rather, it's a system where you collect medals. If you die during the level, you'll lose your collected medals for that particular zone. It's kind of annoying when I first figured that out. I was like, oh, I lost all my medals. That's that's lame. They're not like essential. They're just used to unlock cosmetic stuff in the uh, game store. And you can also oh, always revisit levels to collect more medals if you'd like. There are also uh, collect collectible berries that will unlock special stages not the special stages to get the emeralds they'll unlock special stages uh where you can collect medals or uh more rings and just kind of rank up a score there are however special zones where you go inside of a giant ring and you can collect a chaos emerald another new thing to this game is each chaos emerald gives you a new power for a limited amount of time uh so all seven chaos emeralds are there if you collect all seven 
Sonic can, of course, become supersonic, but each each emerald will give you a new ability. Uh, for example, there's a time freezing ability. There's another ability that causes like hundreds of Sonics to spawn on the screen and just run in every direction and they'll blow up enemies that appear. There's another ability that causes you to sprout like a thing of ivy from the ground so that you can climb up places. Uh, there's another ability that allows you to do like a homing attack. So some neat abilities to play around with and definitely adds kind of replayability especially in the sense that you can revisit older stages and use some of these new abilities to unlock new things such as pathways you couldn't go before. Overall it's a pretty great game. I do like it a lot. However it's a bit pricey in my opinion. It's a $60 game and like that's great but like I just beat it. I bought it on the 17th and I already beat the Sonic storyline collected all seven chaos emeralds i have the trip storyline to play through so i guess i still have more and i could still play through the game with the other characters but like it's a sonic game is what it boils down to uh, i i think the game should have probably been priced at like 39.99 not 59.99 uh so maybe if you're a massive sonic fan pick up the game if you just can't wait to play it like i couldn't but if you're not dying to play a sonic game right now maybe wait for a sale i would say pick it up when it goes on sale for like 40 or 30 dollars Currently, the version on Steam is not well received because it requires you to install the Epic Games Launcher and it also has de novo DRM protection which is lame because apparently when Sega submitted the game for review they gave Valve a non-de novo protected version to test on the Steam Deck and uh, Valve said oh the game can be played on the Steam Deck you don't need an internet connection here's the thing de novo requires you to have an internet connection they'll probably get rid of de novo usually they they've had it in a bunch of their games and then they'll immediately remove it once a backlash like from fans occurs so they'll probably get rid of it within like the next month or two um so if you're planning to get it you might want to pick up the console version or wait until the de novo version gets patched out anyway today's episode actually comes to us from a listener i was gonna say viewer but we're not a, we're not a web show unless he's peeking through the windows but a listener named noah who reached out to us and suggested that we talk about the game no one lives forever because i alluded to it back when we talked about the james bond games with our good buddy josh from still loading so yeah today's episode we're going to talk about no one lives forever so this one's for you noah hope you enjoy it hope we cover it efficiently but if not send us another email and tell us everything we got wrong but to get into today's topic we're going to actually talk a bit about the company that made no one lives forever and that company is monolith we've talked about monolith a little bit before a long time ago i previously played a game of theirs blood for one of my recently plays and seth had me play claw as a retro rewind today though we're going to take a bit of a dive into the company's history itself and their forgotten gem no one lives forever monolith productions was founded in october of 1994 by brian goble brian Waite, brian bowman i just want to make a note for the listeners brian goble and brian Waite both spell their names for brian the same b-r-i-a-n brian bowman however spells his name differently b-r-y-a-n i'm sure it was a lot of confusion at the office just as it was for me it was also founded by garrett price jace hall paul renault and toby gladwell the name of the company was chosen as they needed to have a name that was eight characters or less due to the fact that dos had restrictive naming structures the word monolith came up and they realized that not only was the name monolith not taken by a studio but it was exactly Exactly eight characters long so they said that's the name the first game that they would produce was blood which actually saw its start over at a company called q studios q studios was a 3d realms funded indie developer its development began in 1995 and q studios would eventually be acquired by monolith in 1996 at the start of 1997 all rights to blood were sold to monolith as 3d realms wanted to focus on another build engine game called shadow warrior blood is a unique game it's one of the two games that took advantage of the build engine support for voxel objects in the game this could be seen with weapons items and some decorations in the level themselves voxel objects for those unaware are fully 3d objects as opposed to sprites that exhibit faux 3d so for example if you're playing doom if you're looking at like an object on the ground it's a sprite that will like adjust rotation depending on where you're looking at it uh, a voxel object is a full 3d object so that makes it kind of unique. Blood is also unique in the sense that it lives up to its name. It has a ridiculous amount of graphic violence, with monsters and bad guys often exploding into fountains of blood. In fact, zombies in the game can have their heads knocked off and kicked like soccer balls across the screen. And if you kick their 
heads enough, they explode. So Blood finished development, it was released, and would be released by Monolith, and they ended up selling the publication rights and sequel rights to GT Interactive. Monolith's next game, Claw, was a shift to the dynamic that they started with Blood. While Blood is a cult-centric, gothic, graphic, first-person shooter, Claw is a 2D side-scroller where you play as an anthropomorphic pirate cat who is looking for an amulet. Uh, development on Claw mostly began because Jason Hall, CEO of Monolith, wanted there to be more non-violent games that were family-friendly, which is hilarious considering the game they just released featured literal bathtubs full of blood and organs. They were like, this is a little much. There's probably an audience out there that we're just leaving behind. And so they shifted and made Claw. In 1998, Monolith released Shogo, Mobile Armor Division, known in development as Riot Mobile Armor. The game is a first-person shooter that also features mechs, because everything's better with mechs. The game is heavily inspired by Appleseed, which is pretty evident in the box art, which appears to be inspired by the art of Masamu Shiro. Yeah, who is the creator of Appleseed, which is a manga and anime. Uh, Masamune Shiro also created Ghost in the Shell. Now, the game differs from other mech games, like Mech Warrior, which was out in the market at the time, in that the controls are the same as a standard first person shooter. Or like Steel Battalion, which I think was also in the market at this time. Yeah. Steel Battalion, where you had like a million buttons and dials. And then you had Mech Warrior, where you had to make sure all of your vents were okay and that you were. A lot like... of things were like mounted on the keyboard, right? With Mech Warrior. It has a lot of like keyboard shortcuts for things. Yeah. Yeah, like figuring yeah, out if things are venting. Mech Warrior is and... complicated, but not as complicated as Steel Battalion. Right. Steel Battalion is complicated complicated because you need your own desk for just the steel battalion controller (laughs) correct shogo mobile armor division was easier (laughs) yeah it was with a with your mouse and then you're good yeah uh now shogo mobile armor division was critically acclaimed but underperformed in sales hundred thousand units were shipped to retailers but only twenty thousand units were sold during the christmas shopping season and as we know from classic gaming brothers in the past if you don't sell during christmas you're not going to make it Reviews, however, were great. The game got four and a half stars out of five from GamePro, nine out of ten from IGN, four out of five stars from Next Generation, and the Cincinnati Inquirer, a reputable news source, gave it three stars out of four. I just like that it was listed on the list of like reviews. I've never seen the Cincinnati Inquirer, so I had to put it in. Top tier game reviewers over here. The poor sales of the game would lead to a cancellation of an expansion pack for the game. The same year as Shogo, uh, Monolith decided that. Uh, well, you know, that was a fun little deviation. Let's go back to violence. And they released Blood 2, The Chosen. The game used the same engine as Shogo, the Lith Tech engine, and this meant the game did not need to rely on the shortcomings of the build engine and was able to utilize full 3D environments and objects. Unfortunately, however, when the game was released, it was not well received initially. It had issues with bugs and glitches and ultimately was unfinished. And the poor sales of Blood 2 and the poor sales of Shogo made some people believe that the first-person shooter genre was not as big as people believed it to be, as the only major success in the past few years had been Half-Life. While Shogo was ultimately a commercial failure, and Blood 2 was both a commercial and a critical flop, both games inspired the team to not make the same mistakes for their next project, No One Lives Forever. Development on No One Lives Forever started in 1998. Craig Hubbard, who had designed Shogo, indicated that Shogo's failure was a grim reminder of the perils of wild optimism and unchecked ambition. I want that on my tombstone. They also wanted to fight back against the stigma of the company from the release of Blood 2 The Chosen, which as we mentioned was very unpolished and buggy. So the company really felt they needed to prove themselves because they had one game that was well received and sold poorly and they had another game that was poorly received and sold poorly. So the company is at this moment they are not doing well. They, they have two strikes. So they got to work on No One Lives Forever, which started life as a spiritual successor to Shogo, though they felt like the game needed to shift paths. Part of this reason was due to the difficulty in finding a publisher for the game, so they actually were starting to kind of redesign the game on the go to cater to publishers' interests. They had tried to work with various publishers to sign on, but no one did. Because of the changes, though, the game went from a paramilitary action thriller to a 1960s spy adventure based on movies like Our Man Flint, Danger Diabolic, and the TV show Get Smart. The theme they came up with evolved from talks with Fox Interactive 
Interactive, who officially signed on as publishers for the PC version of the game. The team signed a contract in August of 1999 and drafted their mission statement, which would be referenced during development. The mission statement outlined that the game must have a quote-unquote strong narrative with twists and turns in the spirit of charade or where eagles dare, and that quote-unquote there must be memorable death-defying situations, opportunities for stealth, as well as all-out action. The game was officially announced at 1999's E3. During the early development, the game featured a protagonist named Adam Church, who worked for MI0, also known as Her Majesty's Most Secret Service. Changes began to be made soon after E3, however, with Adam being changed to a woman protagonist to avoid some obvious similarities to a certain 007 James Bond in the games of his. They also reworked some designs of the game to kind of push the theme of the 60s. If you look at some early screenshots of No One Lives Forever, kind of just looks like a generic first person shooter. I could probably put up a screenshot and being like, this was a, a James Bond game and you'd probably believe me. So they really wanted to go in on this 1960s theme and kind of really make that point across. Now, Adam Church was renamed to Kate Archer and was designed to look like actri- actress Mitzi Martin. The choice to base her model after Mitzi was chosen by Fox Interactive, who used their feature film casting department to find appropriate models, mostly to make marketing the game easier, because if you're a character looks like an actor or an actress that the company that is publishing you has on the payroll, then you can make them do spots for the game. You can just be like, hey, Mitzi, do you mind uh, dressing up like a 60s spy lady and jumping in some commercials for us? Kate Archer's voice was done by actress Kit Harris, who initially recorded her limes in a strong Scottish brogue, but then would go on to change it to a British accent. Almost like Darth Vader. Yeah. Except Darth Vader wasn't British. I think that would be funny if he was, though. (laughs) Now, the title for the game, No One Was Forever, started out as just a working title, but was kept, as evident by we're calling it No One Was Forever. The words, The Operative, were added to the final title, however, making the game's full name, The Operative, No One Was Forever. As there was concerns that keeping the name just as No One Was Forever could have caused issues with the intellectual property owners for James Bond, as the name was a little too similar to nobody lives forever no one was forever nobody lives forever i don't see any similarities myself <laughs> but they didn't want to get sued and let me tell you what the uh fleming estates likes to do <laughs> they love suing and uh, now the music for the game was composed by guy whitmore who was tasked with capturing the 60s spy genre while also avoiding infringing on copyright in fact to avoid legal issues he was instructed to avoid using brass instruments Whitmore Moore's score is also adaptive, meaning that the music will adapt to situations that the players find themselves in. For example, the tempo will increase in combat, or perhaps it will slow down during stealthy parts of the mission. Now, the game would go on to be released in 2000 for Windows, ported to the PlayStation 2 and Mac OS in 2002, and the PS2 port would go on to be published by Sierra Entertainment, and the Mac port was published by Mac Play. The game of No One Lives Forever is a first-person shooter with stealth components. The game features different ways to solve a mission, such as the ability to avoid being detected or just to go in and shoot everything. Kind of like Hitman, specifically Blood Money. If you want to do this game like as stealthy as possible, That is an option. If you want to go in with your rifle and just blast away enemies, that's an option too. Stealth approach requires neutralizing security cameras, guard dogs, and avoiding triggering various alarms. Enemies will be aware of noises that you make, footsteps, or weapons fire. They will also notice footprints in the snow or bodies left in the open. Players can use a variety of weapons or tools to get through the levels. This includes semi-automatic pistols, a revolver, a submachine gun, a sniper rifle, an assault rifle, and various gadgets like a barrette that turns into a lockpick, sunglasses that can be used as cameras, lipsticks that double as explosives, and a belt buckle that hides a zipline. In the game, as mentioned, you play as Kate Archer, a spy for the organization Nudity. Kate is a former cat burglar who was hired by Unity to be their first female spy operative. And this actually comes into play. There are like male spies who don't think Kate's up to the job. It's this kind of whole thing where Kate is essentially trying to prove that she's 
just as good as a spy as anyone else. Your job is to track intelligence and get information on a Russian assassin named Dmitry Volkov and a terrorist organization called HARM, H-A-R-M. Beyond the obvious references to spy films from the era, the game also just pokes fun at James Bond and other tropes of spy movies. However, the game's creators have gone on record saying that it isn't a parody like Austin Powers. It is a spy game that features comedic moments and references. Uh, Though jokes are mostly done through overheard conversation, puns, and visual humor. Uh, One thing, however, you don't see as noted by some contemporary reviewers is non-stop quipping from the main character, which I love that. So occasionally Kate will make some puns, as any good spy would do, but it's not on a constant level like Duke Nukem. She's not bombarding you with like one-liners the whole time. She's mostly silent, Bo will talk during, you know, cutscenes and occasionally will comment on her surroundings if the moment is appropriate. Yeah, Duke Nukem can be sometimes a bit much well it's like i was watching this contemporary i forget the reviewer's name but i was watching this person talk about noah list forever specifically the humor of it and he mentions death loop and death loop has a similar aesthetic yeah. to no one lives forever yeah. But the major difference is Deathloop is very quippy, and the characters are always talking. No one was forever released to a high acclaim. It received 4.5 stars out of 5 from Computer Gaming World, 8 out of 10 from Eurogamer, and 9.3 out of 10 from GameSpot. However, we don't know how the Cincinnati Inquirer reviewed it as. No, we don't. Even though it had high acclaim and was well-received did not sell well. In the US, its sales made up about 36,501 copies by the end of 2000, which equaled to about $1.32 million in revenue. By 2002, they had sold about 350,000 copies. Despite the lackluster sales, the games did receive a few awards, such as Game of the Year from Computer Game Magazines, Action Game of the Year from Computer Gaming World, and PC Gamer, and was nominated for various awards during the fourth annual Interactive Achievement Awards from the Academy of interactive arts and science in terms of its legacy a sequel to no one lives forever was released in 2002 called no one lives forever 2 a spy in harm's way and a spin-off called contract jack uh jack being a acronym or at least appearing like an acronym j-a-c-k uh, and that was released in 2003 no one lives forever 2 scored very well gaining four out of five stars from all game 4.5 out of five stars from computer gaming world eight out of ten from Eurogamer, and nine out of ten from Game Informer. Contract Jack, however, did not score very well, getting 2 out of 5 stars from Computer Games Magazine, 2 out of 5 from Computer Gaming World, and 5.9 out of 10 from GameSpot. So, one of those games did not like the other, one of those games did bad. In the years that followed, No One Lives Forever has been remembered as being underrated, often gaining spots on various most underrated video games lists and such. Uh, There have also been attempts to re-release the game and its sequel, however, there have been a lot of issues with the IP holder. To sum it up, Fox Interactive held the IP, and they were acquired by Vivendi Universal. In 2008, there was a merger with Vivendi and Activision, and this formed Activision Blizzard. Activision sold off some IPs and retained others, and basically, they aren't sure who has the rights at this point. Community manager for Activision, Dan Amrich, stated, quote-unquote, if we had it, I would love to be able to reissue those old games. Reportedly, he even went back to Monolith, who are now owned by Warner Brothers Interactive, to see if they knew who owned the rights and they didn't know either. In 2014, Night Dive filed trademarks for the game and its sequels, but the rights are still unclear. Night Dive attempted to work with both Fox and Activision to search their archive for the rights, but none of that data was digitized and neither company wanted to shift through the years and years worth of files, like physical files, to find that one paper that shows who the rights owner is. So as of now, the rights are in a state of limbo. Basically, Night Dive had filed these trademarks, but they're not planning to release anything out of threat that someone is going to come out of the woodwork and say, like, I own the game. I'm suing you for all this money. Apparently, uh, Warner Brothers Interactive doesn't know who owned the rights. Activision doesn't know who owns the rights. Fox doesn't know who owns the rights. Monolith doesn't know who owns the rights. No one knows who owns the rights. So the game, it's just in this weird state of limbo, which is really unfortunate because this is one of those games that I think would do really well on a platform like GOG. Like, I can see it totally having this whole 
revival and if night dive was able to do their remasters i know for a fact that they would be well received the games are available to download though uh, for free from a website called no one lives forever revival but it should be stated these aren't official venues so i don't want to necessarily say like go out and download them because i don't know who runs these websites i don't want to risk anyone getting like infected or something on their computer i've heard that they are legitimate versions of the game like it will play on your computer but again these aren't like official venues uh, i think it would be more proper if like someone like gog or someone like night dive were to put out the game so that you had an official way to download it in terms of monolith's legacy separate from no one lives forever monolith is still around uh they made games after no one lives forever and uh in fact they're still making games in 2004, they were acquired by Warner Brothers Games, as mentioned, and in the years that followed, they made The Matrix Online, Fear in its sequels, Condemned in its sequels, Gotham City Imposters, Guardians of Middle-Earth, Shadow of Mordor, and Shadow of War, which was the sequel to Shadow of Mordor. They've also been working, apparently, on a Wonder Woman game, which is currently slated as TBA for when it's supposed to be out, so who knows? And that's uh, that's No One Lives Forever, and that is Monolith. Nice, yes, and uh, th- th- thanks again, Noah for the request uh we always appreciate hearing requests so if you uh have another request for any other things that you want to hear us talk about feel free to reach out to us either noah or or anyone else who's listening or if we didn't do this topic justice if we missed a whole bunch of stuff feel free to reach out to us anyway to get into our retro rewind seth had me play theme park mystery theme park mystery was released in 1999 by a company called joint up writing software and it was published by konami uh the game is an adventure game about a mystery at a theme park i didn't get very far in it however as i couldn't figure out my way past the first screen uh you're supposed to put a token inside a zoltan machine i found some tokens and i found the zoltan machine but the tokens would not go inside the zoltan machine and i couldn't figure out why i kept trying to like put the tokens in the token slot and they just kept falling off the screen. And I was able to go to other machines and put the tokens in the token slot and they worked. So I knew I was doing it right. I just think I needed to do something else and I couldn't figure it out. So that's as far as I got. Truly a mystery. Uh, Maybe I'll revisit it, but it seems like an interesting game beyond that. I don't know if I'd recommend it because I didn't get that far. Um, But in any case, that's Theme Park Mystery. Seth, next week you can play Soccer Kid for MS-DOS. Thanks. Zach had me play Conspiracy featuring Donald Sutherland. It's also known as KGB and was released originally for the Amiga and IBM PC compatibles back in 1992. The game would then go on to be re-released as Conspiracy. In the game, you play as Captain Maxim Mikulovich Rukov, who gets transferred to a department in the GRU called Department P. The GRU, for any of those people who are interested, is essentially the Russian's central intelligence. They're the CIA for Russia. And Captain... Uh, Rukov is tasked in Department P to infiltrate the KGB, which is the Russian security police grouping, to investigate a possible corruption within the KGB. It's a first person-ish point-and-click adventure game. Essentially, you look at every screen and you can interact with it and your view is from a first-person view. So you don't move your character around the screen, you just like look at the screen and then you leave the room or whatever room area you're in. The game also has a real-time clock and some of the answers will e- e- have the game end uh, early because you may just immediately lose you can also answer something wrong at one point in time and it may screw you later on in the game so it's like you know early 90s tough adventure games the cd version which i played has donald sutherland playing as rukov's father and has fmv videos interlaced throughout the game which i don't think are even necessary (laughs) in fact they're very pixelated and I don't know if I have to do different aspects correction or anything, but the rest of the game was fine, but the FMVs were horrendous. Like, could not watch them horrendous. I imagine if I, maybe I just have to play around my settings, and maybe I can get it so I can watch them. Regardless, Donald Sutherland plays Rukov's father and gives advice to Rukov in the FMVs. Uh, reviews at the time said that the CD remake really only added a novelty of seeing a mainstream actor in an adventure game and not much else, and I agree with that assessment. Really, adding Donald Sutherland doesn't really add much to this game. (laughs) Now, in terms of the graphics and gameplay of the game, I think it holds up if you're interested in playing a harder adventure game out there. Uh, It is 
kind of niche as it's a investigative detective game taking place in Soviet Russia and you're playing a GRU agent infiltrating the KGB. Like, that's just a lot going on. I do like that when you talk to people, you can talk to them or you can ask them questions or you can demand things of them and you always will say, like, comrade. You'll always say, like, I think this is a great idea, comrade. If you talk weirdly, if you ask people about weird things, they will be like, you're really weird and if you keep talking this way, we will arrest you. So it's a it's a fun game. Zach, uh, next week you can play Abuse for MS-DOS. All right, will do. And with that, I want to thank everyone for listening and thank you, Noah, for the suggestion for No One Lives Forever. Great game. Make sure to check it out if you haven't yet. If anyone has any suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us via our website, classicgamingbrothers.com. We are available on X at CG Brothers Pod, Blue Sky at CG Brothers Pod, Facebook at Classic Gaming Brothers, and Instagram at Classic Gaming Brothers. We're also available on Twitch as Classic Gaming Brothers. Be sure to follow us wherever podcasts can be listened to out there. That'd be great. And with that, am I missing anything, Seth? Uh, Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Seth. And I've been Zach. And we've been the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's That's right. That's right.